Well, hello, citizen jurors. I'm, um, I've been working in the field of large-scale electricity generation for about 30 years in an interdisciplinary way. So I've been looking at the engineering, the economics, and the policy. So I hope you can see the slideshow and hear me. Uh, before getting to the high-level waste proposal, perhaps some background on the potential market would be helpful. So first we have to note that the nuclear industry is a declining industry. The bars show the electricity generation, which peaked in 2006 and has been slowly declining since. The contribution in percentage terms to global electricity has now declined to 10.7%. In terms of global reactor startups and shutdowns, <clears throat> you can see that before 1990, um, startups in the green exceeded shutdowns in the orange, but after 1990, they're pretty well balanced out. And in the future, we can expect further decline because a lot of existing nuclear power stations are reaching the end of their lives and approaching a retirement. In terms of uh, investment in the future, the bars show the time trend for investment in renewable energy and the red line shows investment in global nuclear. So you can see that the big industry now is renewable energy. It's the, it's the industry of the present and the future. And this raises questions about the opportunity costs of this proposed project for burying nuclear waste in South Australia. Could the money be spent much better fostering further growth in South Australia, taking it to 100% renewable electricity rather than uh, with safe technologies, with clean technologies, rather than risking the nuclear waste thing? Okay. Um, and the problem is that we can't really trust the industry. The left-hand side of this uh, table shows claims by the World uh, Nuclear Association, and the right-hand side gives the reality. I can't, there isn't time to go through them now, but if you have time to look at this later, you'll see a huge difference between what is promised and what is the reality. Now, for high-level waste management, currently, most spent fuel is in ponds at reactors, and maybe some of it has been transferred to dry casks, not many, and it's dry casks that would be imported into South Australia under this scheme, placed in temporary storage for some decades, really, and then if a repository can be built, uh, buried underground. The only problem is that there are no operating repositories of the kind that are proposed, and although Sweden and Finland are building them, and the US repository that was partially constructed at Yucca Mountain was abandoned after spending $13.5 billion US. Does South Australia want to spend lots of money and then possibly abandon its project? So the South Australian project um, is somewhat heroic to say the least, because no country has so far succeeded in building and operating such an underground dump or repository, as the proponents prefer to describe it. And we have to ask, how, why should we assume that Australia could succeed when the world's richest country, the United States, has so far failed? So that's the first concern of worry, that Australia might, in, or South Australia, backed by Australia, because South Australia, it is doubtful whether it could afford it itself, that South Australia might embark on this project and then fail, be stuck with uh, many dry casks in interim storage. But there's a, an even worse scenario. When you're doing the economics, you have to consider risk. And unfortunately, the studies that have been done to date have not really taken the huge risks seriously. One of the um, assumptions made by the Royal Commission and Jacobs is the heroic assumptions that customers would pay up front upon delivery for the whole thing, for their share, not only in interim storage, but they would pay for the underground repository before it has been built in many cases. Now, this is a very risky scenario, both for South Australia and for the customers. You've got one minute, Mark. One minute. Because there is the possibility that the... Uh, 
that the in initial investments would be made, but the customers would refuse to pay upfront for under the underground repository, leaving South Australia stuck with many dry casks, which over a period of decades would decay and begin to leak because they are temporary storage systems. And then South Australia and Australia would be stuck. So my final slide is to respond to the basic question under what circumstances, if any, could South Australia pursue the opportunity, etc. And my answer is, well, it really could only do this if it maintains the following two delusions. And the first is the delusion of grandeur that Australia could do what no other country has yet achieved, which is to build the permanent underground dump. And the second delusion is that it could manage the financial risk and the associated physical risks of being stuck with leaking dry casks of high-level wastes while being unable to build for financial reasons or for, uh, for engineering reasons, being unable to build a permanent underground repository. The risks are huge, and yet they haven't been adequately addressed. Thanks very much. Great work. Thank you, Mark. Now we've got Richard Blandy, who's live and in the room. Cool. Chris will create his magic. He actually carries a wand, I've seen it. And the wand will work in just a moment. There'll be magic dust. There'll be stars. Picture yourself when you can see a presentation right before your eyes. It's a beautiful moment. Brilliant. See? Told you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Richard. Time to this. Not not working. How's that? Better. Thank you. Um, and thank you, members of the jury, for giving up your valuable time on this important exercise. Uh, summary of my presentation. Can, first of all, can I say that I, I appear here on behalf of I'm a South Australian grandfather and uh, I'm appearing here on behalf of my grandchildren. There is no global market at present for high-level nuclear waste. The forecast profitability of the proposed high-level nuclear dump rests on highly optimistic assumptions. Such a dump could easily lose money instead of being a bonanza. The business case for the proposed dump is speculative and weak. The dump proposal, in my opinion, should be abandoned. And the killer point, Erin Brockovich says that the proposed dump is a bad idea and I rest my case. <laughs> the, the guts, the, all, of my, all of my information about the nuclear dump in fact comes from the Royal Commission's report. Okay, so in the guts of the economic analysis of the dump is figure J6, appendix J, page 299 of the Royal Commission's report. So you can look that up. And this figure shows that uh, in, if we got a price not of 1.75 million per tonne, uh, but uh, a price equal to the cost per tonne of constructing such a dump in Sweden or Finland, in Finland, it's a th the cost is a third of the price that we are projecting that we can get for accepting nuclear waste. Uh, what would happen if Finland were to decide, or somebody like Finland, were to decide to have a go themselves? Surely the price would fall. And we, instead of getting a half of the world's market for nuclear waste, uh, we only got a quarter. So if the price were to fall and uh, the quantity that we interred in South Australia in the dump were to fall, the dump would have a negative commercial present value. 
That's in the, in, that's in the Royal Commission's report. In other words, the dump would be a business dud. Now, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm an expert in, in doubtful figures. Uh, in the 1980s, at the request of Premier John Bannon, I led the team that put together South Australia's winning bid for the multifunction polis. I'm, I was the multifunction polis expert, you see. And the, the, uh, the, the interviewing team from Canberra said to me, that the chairman said to me he had never seen such a brilliant set of figures, rubbery figures. He had never seen such a brilliant set of rubbery figures. In fact, our bid's rubbery figures were better than the other state's rubbery figures, and so we were awarded the project. Eventually, of course, the Japanese stepped away and we were left with Gilman and other places to the north. Second, in 1991, the State Bank collapsed uh, under, because it took on excessive risk in an attempt to assist the state's economy under the urging of Premier Bannon. It cost, instead, it cost the state a lot, as we all know, and Premier Bannon lost his job. Even on the grossly optimistic assumptions of the Royal Commission's Appendix J, the net present value of the dump, discounted commercially at 10% per annum, is only 11.5 billion, interest on which, at 10%, would add just over 1% to South Australia's gross state product, which is currently 100 billion. So we would add 1% to the state's gross domestic product. Uh, there's only 4,500 full-time jobs would be created building the dump and only 600 full-time jobs looking after it when it's built. This is all out of the report, compared with more than 500,000 full-time jobs that currently exist in the state and 800,000 jobs altogether. So this is not the bonanza that people believe will happen. <coughs> Tom Coutsantonis said in his budget speech, uh, there is no single measure or silver bullet that will address the challenges our state currently faces. Not Olympic Dam or the future submarines, not Arium, nor the Nuclear Royal Commission. But tax cuts are key, innovation's important, education's vital, health's essential, and infrastructure is critical. So summing up, the proposed high-level nuclear dump is a distraction from the real path to a better economic future for our state, based on our skills, innovative capabilities and our capacity for hard work. These are our real strengths, not gambling on finding an easy way out of our present economic difficulties. As Mr Coutsantona said, there is no silver bullet. Thank Thanks, you. Richard. Okay, thanks speakers. Now we're gonna kick along and I'd like to introduce Richard Dennis, if you could. Uh, thank you. Um, and look, I, I agree with Richard number one. Uh, you know, congratulations and thanks to you guys. Uh, and the after lunch session is always the hardest. So uh, good on you for keeping on going. Um, actually, think about this, that a, a, economists, the kind of central thing, central concept that economists focus on is something called opportunity cost. And it's come up a few times today. And opportunity cost means that once you spend your resources, time, money, whatever, once you spend your resources doing one thing, you give up the opportunity to do that, to do something else. So the opportunity cost for you guys of being here is huge, you know, and good on you as good citizens for making that choice. The, the opportunity cost for the South Australian government of having this process is huge. You've already spent $10 million, $10 million that could have been spent on health, could have been spent on education, having a consultation. But you're not having a consultation about what kind of state you want. You're not having a consultation about where do you want to be. You're not having a consultation about of all the ways you could create jobs, which are the best ones. None of that evidence has been put to you. There has been no economic evaluation of the opportunity cost. 
There's just a whole bunch of economic modelling, which I'll come to in a second, that says, look at all the benefits of this one idea. Just look at the one idea. Just Let's all sit around and just say, wouldn't it be good if someone gave us $50 billion for a dump? And you know what? It'd probably be great. <laughs> if, if someone gave you $50 billion and there were no downsides, it's a bit hard to understand why you wouldn't say yes to $50 billion with no, ups with no downsides. But that's not what you're actually being asked. The opportunity cost for the state is not just your time, but 10 million bucks. And what I've found in the analysis I've done of what's been put to the Royal Commission is you still haven't done a cost-benefit analysis. Imagine a proposal to build a, a, an asbestos dump where there was no estimate yet of the health costs of asbestos. There is no cost-benefit analysis being done yet. There's just these heroic assumptions about the upsides or this potential revenue. Now, in, in the first session this morning, uh, Tim said that you know, we should have faith in these projections about price, these projections about quantity, and please, it's all on tape, go have a look at the first session. He said that Ernst & Young had made sure that he hadn't done anything silly. Well, I just want to read how Ernst & Young describes what they did. This is verbatim front page of Ernst & Young's report to the Royal Commission. And this is kind of, they were given, here's the price of, here's the price, uh, of uh, nuclear waste, which I think is exaggerated. Here's the likely quantity, which I think is exaggerated. These numbers were given to Ernst & Young. And when Ernst & Young did their version of the analysis, here's what they wrote on the front page. Ernst & Young has prepared this economic assessment in conjunction with and relying on information provided by the Commission and business cases commissioned uh, for the study. Here's where it gets interesting. Ernst & Young, we do not imply and it should not be construed that we've performed an audit or a due diligence process, uh, procedure on any of the information provided to us. We have not independently verified and Ernst & Young say they do not accept any responsibility or liability for independently verifying any such information, nor do we make any representation as to the accuracy or completeness of the information. Now, when Tim puts his slides up, you'll see that Ernst & Young kind of had a look at the numbers. Yeah, they looked at the financial numbers. They looked at if you multiply a high price by a large quantity, do you get a big result? Yeah, you do. That, but the question for you guys is, do you really think that if you build this thing and it makes so much profit that no one else is going to enter the market? I'm an economist. Economics is about opportunity cost and economics is about understanding how companies and customers interact with each other. And by his own admission, Tim says, We're not, we didn't do an economic analysis, quote, we didn't do an economic analysis, we looked at financial you know, uh, financial models. Yeah, if someone pays you $1.75 million a tonne, for lots of tonnes you'll get a lot of money. That's not modelling, it's multiplication. And Ernst and & Young said, we didn't audit the, re the reliability of the price estimate. We just said, yep, yeah, if you multiply that by that, you'll get that. One minute, thanks, Richard. Now, this morning when I was talking to Mike, he said, no, I looked at the big picture. I didn't look at the data. <laughs> and Ernst and Young have told you, we didn't look at the data. Well, I have looked at the data. And if you think you're going to get $1.75 million per tonne, you're going to make huge profits, but those huge profits won't attract new entrants into the industry, that's a hope. <laughs> that's not a strategy and it's not economics. Apple don't assume that no one else will invent a smartphone. IBM assumed and the ABS assumed that everything would go well on census night. <laughs> Assuming things is easy. <laughs> Delivering things is hard. And what you have been fed is not an objective economic evaluation of all of the costs and all of the benefits and all of the risks from broad perspectives, a $10 million taxpayer-funded process has got you one quote so far. 
One quote from Jacobs who described themselves as helping their nuclear energy industry partners solve their problems. I'll read you a quote if you want me. That's fine. I respect that that's their opinion. And the big picture question is, if this is such a great idea, why doesn't Jacobs invest in it? They've come to the taxpayer and said, there's 51 billion to be made. We're a profit-seeking firm. You should take it. If this was a great idea, BHP would be spending the $10 million on the next process. If this was a great idea, the Japanese government would say, we'll put the $600 million up front that's actually required to do the geological and other work. If this was a great idea, in capitalism, someone would be chasing the $51 billion. And the key assumption in the Jacobs report and the, product and the uh, Royal Commission finding the key assumption is this is hugely lucrative, but no one else will enter the market. That's not economics. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Tim. Okay, let's now hear from Tim Johnson. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Tim Johnson. I work for Jacobs, whose name has come up a few times since today. And my name's come up, I think, just about as many. Um, you've heard three very good presentations, which are, I would suggest demonstrating some of the potential downsides and some of the risks associated with a project like this. This project, is, if it goes, it's very much in its early stages. Many of the things that I believe you've heard about can be resolved, but they're not resolved yet. Let me just explain where, where, where we come from. The, when the Royal Commission had started, it decided it would get an independent assessment of the costs and the business case for the management and disposal of international radioactive waste. We bid for that. I think we were one of five companies, and we got the job. We presented our approach and the way we're going to go about it in a public session of the Royal Commission. It's available on that link there. And the Royal Commission requested the public put in um, comments and, and so on so to, make, to see if the approach was considered appropriate. We spoke to many international people. We reviewed a lot of literature and we took the advice of, of the experts who presented to the Royal Commission. And we gave a draft report to the Royal Commission in January 2016 prior to them issuing the tentative findings. In that intervening period, they did get Ernst & Young to have a look at our model and they went through it. It isn't part of the report that Richard um, read the disclaimer for. We were after we got feedback on the tentative findings, including um, from Australia Institute and others, Richard, Richard I believe, uh, we, the Royal Commission considered those and asked us to do some more work. In particular, we looked at the reserve fund and brought some of the money going into the reserve fund forward, which had a small impact but not a major one. And we also looked at transport risk assessment, and we have a report of that, and that's been used in another part of the Commission's report. We also clarified the extent and extended the period of post-closure monitoring to make sure we looked at costs throughout the cycle. And during this process, we participated in a number of workshops with the CMAC committee which I think, as you probably heard from Mike's talk this morning, is five eminent professors from Adelaide and Canberra. So they gave us an overview of whether we're doing the right sort of thing. Now, moving on, that's what we did. The, a lot of the conversation today has been about the willingness to pay. Will we get 1.75 million tonnes? And the answer is we don't genuinely know. We, there is no market, as has been explained before. So we've had to infer what we think the likely cost is by looking at proxies and looking at other costs which are associated with waste. And this shows that on a little line, both in Australian dollars and US dollars, because most of the market is outside Australia, um, what the likely range of costs we predict is, is going to be. And you can see from the blue downward arrow, we have gone for a number of around one and a half million US dollars, or 1.75 Australian dollars. And you can see there are quite a few examples of where costs to potential client countries could be significantly enhanced to that. But we don't know, and we don't expect that every country will have the same willingness to pay. But for the aid of modelling and to identify a base case, we just chose that as a representative number. 
We then actually looked at how much it's going to cost to put these facilities in place. Initially, we had to identify what the facilities were. Then would they be um, separate or co-located and so on? And we used a lot of um, established data. They are big civil engineering jobs. They require a lot of mining, making holes in the ground, filling those holes up with waste, which is in purpose-built canisters, bringing waste to another large slab of concrete and putting it in um, containers which were available on the market. And we developed both top-down and bottom-up costs. A top-down cost is we said, well, how much does it, is it going to cost the Finns to do it? Let's convert those finished prices and so on to Australian prices, and then we'll say that's how much it should cost in Australia. The other approach is to say it requires this many kilometers of tunnel, it requires this many casks, it requires this many kilometers of railway line and so on, and you add up the individual <laughs> costs. And then we do as a sanity check, we check that we're getting similar ballpark numbers. It is a ballpark number. We call it an AAC, that's cost engineers class five concept. So what we did was we created our, no, our number and we added 25% before we started. Because we recognize that we won't capture everything and things can go up. We've all used, all used inflation and so on at the same time. And we put phasing of costs over time. We put in a lot of costs and I'll just show that very briefly on it goes to the safety case development and compliance. That is key, you've got to do it properly. We, in the same way we looked at capital expenditure, we looked at operating expenditure. We went through the various things that you could look for. And we, again, we use overseas examples and in industry benchmarks. And the, we identify for the different scenarios how long the, the project would be running, and therefore we had durations of those costs. On that basis, we developed a commercial model. And it's, it was really, it is, as um, Richard said, it's not an economic model, it's a financial model. We, Ernst and Young were separately appointed by the commission to do some economic modeling. And we identified that for most of the different configurations, the costs were moderately similar. But it, it was quite clear that if you did things more quickly, you would get a higher net present value, and that's because some of your income comes through sooner. This is the slide that Richard has talked about and said this is the one which concerns him most. If you look in the bottom left-hand corner, the bottom blue line dips below zero under certain circumstances. And that is at a very low, at a very low price, 750, and a low capture rate. Then the net present value, after you've paid the 15% into the wealth fund, of course, uh, then the, it dips below zero. So that is not a position you want to be in. You, and, but it isn't actually the key criteria for whether you go ahead. There's a lot more work to do, but the key element is actually how much waste do you need to have contracted at the time of the decision to proceed. Now, we're saying the decision to proceed is going to happen in maybe six years' time. Who knows? We, we made that modelling assumption. At that time, you need to have signed, sealed, firm contracts for existing waste, not waste which is about to be produced, waste which already exists with some reliable countries. And we're thinking of South Korea, um, Japan, and, and possibly Taiwan as the main ones. But there are quite a few others in the list who could potentially be launch partners. And they need to have signed up sufficient waste so that we can actually build all the facilities, we can move the waste into deep geological disposal, we can remediate all the facilities, we can keep money aside for long-term monitoring and so on. And that is how much waste we need, around 15 to 20,000 tonnes. If after you've got those initial contracts, our competitors, if we don't know who they are yet, but competitors may arise and the market price may drop, or it may increase, then you can make a decision on whether or not you take more contracts. You can make that decision safe in the knowledge you've got your initial contracts, and your initial contracts will pay for the safe completion of the project and will put money into the wealth fund. Well, I've been asked several times what happens if the costs blow out. You can see for our base case, we go down from 11.5 to 8.8 .8 billion at 10% discount if, if both the capex and the opex are increased by 50%. And we didn't take it further, but you could easily do it for 100%, and it has a similar sort of impact. A um, couple of quick slides on post-closure monitoring. That was con a concern which was raised, and I've seen it raised by the, by the jury. We have considered it. We've looked at how it can be, be accumulated. And what we say is you have a very large reserve fund. It grows about 45 billion pounds into our base case. And that fund predominantly is used for disposing of the waste after imports cease. It's the money for um, decommissioning and remediation. And we made a very conservative estimate of how much it will cost to close these facilities at the end of life. 
And then the bit left in the bottom corner here is sufficient for indefinite monitoring according to international guidance, IEA guidance. So, in conclusion, we're an independent consultant. We don't have any position regarding the waste project. We were commissioned by the Royal Commission to identify and provide them reference wherever possible data which they could use in their report. We don't come as a proponent or an opponent. We used international data and many experts' inputs to seek these best estimates, and we've identified where we're having to make assumptions. Um, and we sanity checked the model, as I think I explained, by looking at top up and bottom down and getting Ernst Young to look through the line items. And the key one is we've identified the volume of waste contracts that must be signed up before you make a decision to go ahead and construct. You can't, you'd be very foolish to go ahead and construct if you had not got those waste contracts signed up. And they should be contracts for the, for the total amount of money. You shouldn't be having, we'll pay you so much now and so much later. You need the whole lot of money. You've got to have those things in place. And if you do that, then you can feel confident that you'll have a project which will make a certain amount of money through the wealth fund. And if the price remains in the sort of numbers we expect, you'll enter into further contracts. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, and we've got the fantabulous Barbara Pocock. Yeah, I could do a, I think I'm, um, we should make a musical contribution about now. I don't know how you're all going, but <laughs> this is the third time through. Um, and uh, yeah, my name is Barbara Pocock. Um, I'm an economist and I spent the last 30 years inside universities studying and researching employment issues. So I'm not a nuclear specialist, but I'm a member of a group called Mothers for a Sustainable South Australia who decided when we heard the debate was coming on a year or so ago that many people in our communities would struggle to make sense of the issue. So we've studied the report, we've put materials in the library here that we've prepared and we've prepared a fact sheet document for you as well. So I'm going to talk about some things that are all up there documented. Um, I've been for the past five years a member of the Economic Development Board of this state which looks at employment creation, investment and uh, 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 job creation. And I just want to just raise one point, and Tim, this is in relation to what you just said about being independent. I'm looking at your website, and it says that our capability across design, engineering and asset optimization, optimization procurement, construction and commissioning, this is what you do, through to con decontamination and decommissioning, site closure, regulatory compliance and environmental services. You're experienced in working on nuclear sites, including in relation to disposal. So I just want to make that point that, you know, if I, were, if I was selling services for clean-up in nuclear sites, I wouldn't call myself independent. So I just want you to know that. Mm -hmm. One other fact I'd like to say to you is you've got three economists here uh, who are all telling you this is not a goer. Is that a fair summary? Uh, and we've got a chemist who's saying, and I think Tim said very clearly, this needs a lot more work. And I think the key question you've got in front of you in the next three days, and thanks for giving them up, to do this work, the question is, will you put more money into going down the road that Tim wants you to go on? And I'm asking you, as a taxpayer and a member of my community, to think very carefully about that, because every dollar, every $10 million, every $1 million we put going down this track means we don't go down a bunch of other tracks. And I know from my work on economic development, there are many other tracks this state can take that will generate a lot of employment, a lot of exports and a lot of investment in our food and wine industry, in our cultural industries, in our visitor economy and so on. So think about opportunity cost is my uh, request to you. But I just want to go through uh, the key issues, and I'm going to be in this corner briefly, the key issues that my group and I am concerned about as an economist. And the first issue um, is really around this very big number which is the profit in net present value terms that we're encouraged to think would be available to us, a very large bucket of money which arises from the kind of financial <coughs> calculation that both Richard and Tim have talked about. And that, getting to that requires, we're learning more and more every day, a certain amount of investment. So we've heard recently in our, in our joint parliamentary committee an investment of more than possibly 600 million, this is Tim speaking on transcript in Hansard, a $600 million further investment before we get to yes, and then having decided to do it, a $2.4 billion investment on port, rail, and other infrastructure that goes ahead of the arrival of the first cask of waste. So a small state, remembering our surplus at the moment is around 300 million, is making, asked to make a very big investment which economists call sunk cost and which you may never recover if waste never comes. 
And one other really important factor to think about in relation to that profit is the profit is only there if we accept and hold all those black canisters of waste that were on Richard's presentation this morning. Above, we receive the checks, we get the casks, we start accumulating interest. We have to accumulate interest in order to fund the construction of the deep geological storage. In Tim's picture that he put up, there are two columns in the financial outcomes which have a negative outcome, and they're the columns where you just take the waste and you put it underground. You can't make money out of building a deep geological storage. In this model, we have to accept the waste, hold the checks, put the money in the bank, and that's the way you get to a profit. So you're accepting a lot of waste for 100 years, as we saw, before you hit payday, or before you can be, be confident about that level of profit. And I want to draw attention to the assumptions which are so critical uh, around reaching that number. And price, we've talked about. It's, it's as Richard, Richard Blandy said, much higher price assumption than is already uh, in evidence in Finland where they're disposing of their own waste. No market. It can only be called a guess. The second assumption that is really critical and we haven't heard much commentary about is around the cost. Just remember how complicated that model is. It's building... Uh, port, rail, transport systems, two large dumps. We're repackaging the canisters on the edge of the deep geological storage, a very complex operation before we put it underground. And it has never been done before. $145 billion cost operation, 70 RAHs. And we build hospitals all around the planet. We actually can estimate the price to build a hospital. We just get it wrong sometimes. <laughs> But you can, you can imagine an overrun on this, quite sensibly, of a very sizable amount which very quickly eats into this and does away with it. So, uh, never been done before, very complicated, 25% overrun on the RAH within a few years of starting to do it. Um, I think this is a very heroic, amongst the other assumptions here, quite heroic. And the third one, I'm going to go over by I think. Um, is the quantity. So the quantity is 138,000 tonnes required to be received to achieve this kind of outcome. That's a very large amount of waste. It's half the world's available nuclear waste, remembering that Finland has passed law to say it will not allow itself to export its nuclear waste. It has a moral obligation to dispose of its own. So it's never taking anyone else's waste, but it's only disposing of 6,000 tonnes of its own waste. This model that we're talking about is 20 times bigger than the Finns have just approved the construction approval for. So we're building something way bigger. How do we know? How can we have confidence about this? And I suggest we can't. So it's a very large quantity, and that scale is essential to get to that. The third really heroic assumption is that it all goes to plan. Because as soon as anything goes wrong, as soon as there's any kind of accident, as soon as social consent is withdrawn, either in the community, the state, the nation, or internationally, people get nervous about boats going around the world, for example, there may be a bunch of reasons why things stop, then you immediately are eating into this. As soon as all the accident costs or possibilities have to come out of that profit. So accidents do happen in any kind of industry, and certainly in this, and while the probability we don't know, but as soon as you have one, you've got a catastrophic, potentially economic cost. Richard mentioned this, and it's really important. I live in the land of three quotes. In my household, when we buy a fridge, two quotes. In our group, Mossa, if you're having your bathroom fixed, you're in the land of three quotes. We've got one quote from Jacobs. And it's just not plausible to rely so much. And having spent $10 million, a lot of money, We've got one quote from a group of industry insiders when we really need to know a whole lot more if we were going to do it. The only the really scary thing is that even if we commission Richard Dennis or you know KPMG or some other nuclear group, they are going to have to make exactly the same assumptions. So be very careful. If you recommend another $10 million spent on this, just be conscious you're going to be dealing with someone like me or some other economist saying, Assume a price, but there's not going to be a market in 10 years. Assume a cost, because we're not going to know how much it costs. Assume a quantity. So I think we're a long way off reliable economic analysis, and, and we're a long way off uh, useful investment in um, new reports. So I think it's really important that we're not dazzled and desperate 
We've been dazzled and desperate before. We had a state bank disaster which cost our state $3 billion and it cost us 20 years of economic confidence. So be careful. We can't afford, we are a small state, a small nation. We need to make sure we use our meagre resources very sensibly for employment growth in diverse ways. And this possibility is, is not only hit, not, not hitting into the black, but possibly hitting significantly into the red with very meagre employment outcomes offered on the table. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Barbara. OK, we're going to have a moment of silence now. And the moment of silence is for you to think without me or anyone else talking at you, to think about a question you'd like to ask. And can you think about that? And while I do this, um, Abby is going to help the panel set up for Q&A. So if you can think about your question in terms of the critical thinking principles, is it an accuracy question? Is it a question about breadth? Is it about relevance, logic, clarity or depth? So some all just about you, silent time to think about what your question could be. Then we'll have the panel ready to go. My friend Chris is going to come up the front with his wand and bring Mark in back on Scott. Okay, sounds like we've had enough of silent thinking time. So, if we can tune back in, please. If we can tune back in, Andrew's rules are, if we keep talking, I'll give you a hug. No offers, right. Okay, so we're, we're gonna, we've got 11 minutes. We've got a question here, and then we'll continue on from here. So, your question, please, and who would you like it to direct it to, Julia? Thank you very much for your time, uh, members of the panel. Uh, Dr Dennis, uh, in your presentation and also this morning, you've stated several times that the uh, Royal Commission did not consider or take into account uh, competition. Um, and you did quote, no one else will enter the market. However, on the Royal Commission report on page 97, there is a section called competition. And if I might just read from it, it says, it should be underscored that there is a significant potential for other countries to develop a domestic solution and for the project to still remain viable. Would that fall, how, how do you reconcile those two statements? Oh, thank you. Um, yes, no, the, 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 the potential for competition is admitted, but there's no relationship between that and the price assumption, okay? so. So Jacobs, who have said a number of times we're not economists, we've looked at how much we think other people would be willing to pay based on how much we think it would cost them to build their own thing. So, what the, so Jacobs' number isn't an economist's estimate of the competitive price with multiple firms competing for a market. To be crystal clear, they have not done that. But you've raised a really important point. The, the Royal Commission says competition's a possibility, but the people estimating the price haven't estimated what the impact of that competition on the price would be. So you're right, the Royal Commission acknowledges competition, but you're incorrect to suggest that the price estimate acknowledges competition. I, I didn't actually suggest that, but um, also specifically say that... Um, oh, thank you. Do, I mean, do you think it's helpful to say in such black and white terms that it hasn't been considered at all, rather than in the clarified way that you just mentioned then, 
Um, to be crystal clear, and everything I've said this morning is recorded, and watch my previous two performances, they're even better. Uh, <laughs> to be crystal clear, when I say that Jacobs haven't done an economic analysis of the impact of competition on price, I'm quoting them. I'm quoting Tim saying that they didn't do an economic analysis. So the point that I'm making, and if this is ambiguous, then luckily it'll be recorded. The point that I'm making is that that $1.75 million did not come from a group of economists asking what would happen if there was competition in the market. It did not come from that. The fact that the Royal Commission admits that competition is a threat and that the $51 billion number ignores that threat, I'm really glad you brought up the point because it's a fundamental problem. By the way, I'm going to run because I'm going to have to leave when it said it was going to finish. And I have to get back to Canberra where we don't have a nuclear waste dump. <laughs> my my question is to Tim Johnson. My question is to Tim Johnson. In your opening, you said that uh, we have heard some of the downsides from other speakers. Can you uh, tell us what other downsides you see? <laughs> I think that was, um, you're taking rather literally a slightly glib comment. I was saying that I believe between them, they probably covered most of them. Thanks, Tim. Whoops. Hi, I just had a question, I mean, maybe you can answer you from Canberra or one of the others. Um, this isn't specific to South Australia, so the agenda to have a nuclear waste facility has been uh, definitely pursued on two occasions and it's gone wrong, at least in the Northern Territory. It's definitely been raised in other states. Um, so this is really a national agenda. So this is really the Feds being very interested in this and South Australia being, well, we're a bit desperate. <laughs> we are broke. Um, so if, this, if there's no money in this, why is this being pursued so aggressively for the last 15 years? Anyone with an answer? Um, look, exactly, and that's the point about opportunity cost. I mean, anyone here is involved in a community group or a, sport, a sporting club will know how hard it is to get $10 million out of the government. Well, this process has cost $10 million, and I think you're being stepped towards, oh, why don't we do another 10? Keep going, keep going, and that's fine. That's your money. Who's saying that this is? What is the signal? So who's saying that there's money in this? Who's saying that this is necessary for our country? Yeah. That this is something that our country needs to pursue. I mean, is it to pile in our own waste? Is it? You know, what are the? You know, economics is not just numbers; it's also motivations. Yeah. So what is the reason? Look, uh, look, these are great questions that you should ask of each other and all panelists. But to be clear, the the reason you're being encouraged to take this incredibly risky, speculative bet is that you're being told there's enormous returns. Well, you can go put a thousand dollars on thirty one at the roulette table, and you'll get thirty six to one. But there's a ratio, there's a trade off between risk and return and you're being sold a magic pudding. This is no risk, but there's huge returns. That's not economics, okay? And what economics would say is that, uh, is that if, you, if 51 billion was on the table, others will come, others will push your price down. So... Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, um, my question is directed to Tim Noonan. Um, Dr. Gerald Ossinosian from... Um, the nuclear facility in France stated today that all European Union countries have legislation stating that each country must and will be responsible to store their own nuclear waste. Um, has your business actually factored this into the economic, economic um, liabilities that it will cost to actually get the EU to change those laws in the hopefully very near future for us to secure some sort of financial gain from this or was that overlooked at the time? We looked at, um, we made the assumption that the larger states, which is most of the EU, um, China, North America, and a couple of others will have domestic solutions. We've looked at, then we then identified a whole other list of countries which have got um, nuclear waste piles and are producing nuclear waste. The bigger ones of those, are, I think it's Japan is by some way the biggest, South Korea, Taiwan, 
there are some smaller countries in there from lots of different countries. I can't remember whether any of them are EU or not, but they weren't a significant part of the total. So we discounted those countries we think have a, will have a domestic solution. Um, this lady just down the front here. Thank you. Sorry, just building on... Uh, building. This, sorry, this is our final question. Okay, oh, better make it good. Yep. Um, with no that, um, I'm just wondering for... Um, I think, Tim, um, whether those countries have been approached yet to actually determine whether they would actually consider South Australia as a storage facility and what they would actually pay for that storage as well, or whether it's just you've done had a look at the, the, uh, the, the literature out there that's here. It's mainly literature, and that's not because we didn't want to, but I, my understanding, and look, this is outside what I was asked to do, so I'm... I'm recalling what the Royal Commission said, they, they said that they were not in a position to have those conversations at this time. Clearly, that is what, like, the most important thing that they, we have to do. Yeah. Until we can actually have those conversations and, and similarly, and so we can see the appetite for the client countries for this project, if there's real appetite, then those countries will probably put most of, our, of the risk money, the opportunity costs that has been mentioned. It's that appetite, and, and until you actually have those conversations, we won't know what that appetite is. Thanks, Tim. Um, Michael, can I throw it to you? You look like you've got something there to say. Maybe not. Okay. I'm sorry, folks. Oh, Mark, sorry. I'm getting my people mixed. Mark, can you hear me there? Uh, yes, I can hear sorry, you. Mark. My name is Mark and not Michael. Yes, apologies. <laughs> you've, got a, you've got a very good-looking twin brother. Look, I just want to remind people that the International Atomic Energy Agency has a joint convention on the safety of spent nuclear fuel management and that it requires countries who generate waste to manage them domestically. So it's not, this is not just a European Union thing, this is a, a global thing and it's non it would be non-trivial to get special permission to go against that, that joint convention.